Good evening, and welcome to the April 27th, 2023 meeting of the Bloomington Planning Commission. The Planning Commission is made up of seven volunteer Blooming residents appointed by the City Council. Tonight we have five, which is a quorum. The Commission advises the City Council on development proposals, development standards, long-range planning, and transportation issues. Our work is informed by the City's comprehensive plan, various district plans, and the City Code. For some items, the Commission makes a recommendation with the City Council having final decision-making authority. In other cases, the Planning Commission can approve or deny an application subject to appeal to the City Council. For each action item, there will be a staff report, an opportunity for the applicant to present, then time for any member of the public to provide testimony. Our first order of business tonight is the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand as you are able. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Um, tonight we have four items, one public hearing, three study items. Uh, I'd start by asking the planning manager to share information on how to testify remotely. Chair Roman, uh, commissioners, we have one public hearing tonight, item one. And uh, just as the public can testify here in the chambers, if you're watching from home, you can testify remotely as well. What you would do is call the number on the screen and then enter in the access code. And we will have this number uh, flashing on the screen periodically during that item. Thank you. Thank you. The first item is a public hearing on uh, comprehensive plan text amendments. And I believe Planner Ramler Olson has the staff report. And when, there you go. Uh, yes, uh, Chair Rope. Sorry about that. That's okay. Oh, peeked ahead. Sorry about that. Um, can uh, just wanted to make sure that the presentation is view viewable. Yes, we can see it. Okay, terrific. We're seeing it. Uh, there you yes. go. Perfect. There we go. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, thank you for that introduction. This is a public hearing for or to consider a comprehensive plan amendment. And this is in response to the 2022 system statement issued by the Metropolitan Council last September in uh, 2022. Um, yeah, this is a summary of the proposal. Uh, this, uh, this is a CPA or comprehensive plan amendment to incorporate revisions noted in that system statement. And uh, also noted on this slide is that the bulk of the revisions are focused on section four. That's the transportation element of the comprehensive plan. But there is a figure in section seven, the community facilities uh, section, that was also revised to respond to the 2022 system statement. A little bit of background. Um, the Metropolitan Council provides a definition of a system plan. It's a long range comprehensive, I mean, it's a, it's a suite of long range comprehensive plans for the regional system. You see all the plans that are encompassed. Um, it includes capital budgets for wastewater services, transportation, uh, recreational open, open space. Uh, the system statement uh, is, uh, is a, uh, a document that basically describes updates to those system plans. It's specific to each community within the metropolitan area. It su summarizes those changes. It's prepared by the Met Council to help metro area communities understand updates to system plans. And it helps those communities appropriately revise their comp plan to be uh, in compliance with state statute. Um, I think it's also worth noting that the CPA or concert, I'll just say CPA, um, the CPA is distinct from the decennial comp planning process. Uh, you'll notice that uh, staff did not do a wholesale revision of the entire comp plan. And um, even in those sections, you know, the, uh, those bigger chunks of the comprehensive plan, we stuck strictly to what was noted in the system statement. We um, did not veer off. So, if, you know, it's, it's worth noting that some things are, it, it hasn't, it, it's been enforced, uh, you know, for a few years now, but some things are out of date. Uh, and for those things that were noted in the system statement, that's what we revised to bring them up to date to reflect the uh, latest editions of the uh, 
or those latest versions of the system plans, but we did not revise everything that was out of date within the comprehensive plan. That will be done in the next few or in the in the coming years when we uh, redo you know do this whole decennial comp planning process. So I just wanted to make that a point. Uh, this is a timeline summarizing um, how we got to this uh, this point in time. In 2015, the Met Council adopted the 2040 tra uh, Transportation Policy Policy Plan and the Regional Parks Policy Plan. Um, in 2020, the Met Council updated those two system plans. In 2022, as was noted, uh, Bloomington received its a system statement from the Met Council, which obligated it to incorporate revisions to reflect reflect the system statements within nine months, which would put us at the end of June in 2023, which you can see on the timeline. This table uh, is, um, is is just basically a carbon copy of what was in the staff report, summarizing all the revisions that staff made to uh, bring it in compliance with this, uh, bring our comp plan within compliance, uh, compliance with the uh, system statement. I'm not going to go through everything, but it's there for your reference. If you'd like to go into more deep, if you'd like, uh, if you request that we go into more detail, I'm happy to do that. But I'm just providing you here just to to uh, show you and the public uh, how much of a chain, how many changes were uh, pro are proposed by staff. Uh, summary of updates: Looking at section four, um, uh, a, a bigger theme was changing the project, uh, the status of projects that the Met Council highlighted within their transportation policy plan, the latest iteration. So a lot of things went from planned or under construction as noted in uh, Bloomington's comprehensive plan to complete. And then the language within those sections describing those projects was, uh, was changed to reflect the complete status. So um, th th there are very minor uh, language differences just to, basically reflect the current status of the projects. Some of those are a list of those are included on this slide. Um, the, you know, an inter uh, the interchange at I-494 East Bush Lake Road and um, new right turn lane at um, many, uh, Highway 77 and Old Shockby Road, uh, River Bridge, uh, Minnesota River Bridge uh, replacement, uh, the orange line and the D line, which came um, in operation uh, after the adoption of the comprehensive plan. So the comprehensive plan is now reflecting that those uh, transit system or those transit ways are in operation. Um, other changes that were made uh, in addition to uh, the body of the text of the comprehensive plan were uh, updates to maps. Uh, this is the regional uh, bike trail network. Um, I can't remember the specific figure. I should have clipped that. Nonetheless, um, you'll see clouded on this image what those changes were. So added symbology to show a tier one alignment on Portland Avenue and a uh, tier two alignment um, off to the west side of uh, uh, Bloomington. So those two changes were made to reflect the, uh, the regional bike trail network that the, uh, that the uh, Met Council has um, in place in their uh, in their uh, new transportation policy plan. Uh, another update to uh, Section Four of the Comprehensive Plan was a change of funding status for specific transit ways. Um, there were two uh, ways to describe the the status, the funding status of uh, transit ways. That was within an increased revenue scenario where projects for which there was no identified funding, but if there were, you know, these are the transit ways that would be considered for that that increase in funding. And then there's the current revenue scenario where there are projects identified, they are planned, and they have funding sources. What was updated was the Johnson Lindale arterial BRT was added to the increased revenue scenario in. Uh, new transport or the latest uh, transportation policy plan. And um, also worth discussing or worth noting is uh, American Boulevard was reclassified. It was for, it's still within the increased revenue scenario, but it was previously identified as consideration for an arterial BRT, but now it's a, 
uh, quarter under study, and I believe that study will kick off later this year, so later uh, 2023. So those are uh, some other changes to uh, the funding scenarios for um, for transit ways. Um, another thing to note, um, not a not a huge revision, but just bringing the functional classic classification of roadways within the city up to date. So there is a um, there is a a strip between Norman Lake uh, Boulevard and uh, Norman Lake Road uh, that's now. Uh, identified as a minor reliever. This update was applied to several maps. So, but nonetheless, it, it looks like this. It's just that little tiny strip of the road. And um, also, I suppose there was a, that's worth noting that there's another map that reflects the uh, current amount of lanes within its right of way. Uh, the updates to section seven are focused on one specific figure and that's figure 7.3. This is the recreational trail network within the uh, within the city. I have clouded um, off to the off to the uh, left um, the uh, CP uh, rail trail um, and uh, another uh, uh, regional trail search corridor was um, added by the Met Council, and so this map was updated to reflect that as well as um, another portion of a region, regional trail search corridor extending to the uh, west um, to, uh, uh, I believe, Tread Scott uh, Park in the uh, south, the southwest corner of, of the city. So there are some edits made to this map to reflect the, uh, the, uh, the current trail network and plans for um, other corridors in that uh, part of the city. Uh, there is city uh, staff sent out common forms to adjacent jurisdictions on March 23rd. Um, those included a mix of cities, school districts, regional and state agencies and watershed districts. Uh, thus far, the city has only received seven responses. They have um, 60 days in order to comment on the. On the uh, proposed uh, comprehensive plan amendment. Um, we did receive uh, one form from Eden Prairie School District uh, this past Monday, so that's not in the packet for tonight, but just wanted to bring you up to speed on that uh, latest uh, comment form we received. And so far, we haven't received any public comments, um, but they, those, uh, the, the CBA has been advertised, so it's available for comment by the public. And with that, um, the recommendation before uh, the planning commission is is on this slide. And um, uh, with that, I can take any questions that you may have. Thank you for that. Questions for staff. Okay. Um, seeing that the city is also the applicant and this is a public hearing, I would open the public hearing. Is there anyone in the chambers who would like to testify on the comprehensive plan amendment proposals? Go ahead and come forward and sign in on the sheet for the record and introduce yourself and you've got three minutes. Uh, good evening. My name is Brian Savig. Um, this is a pretty uh, in-depth plan. Um, there seem to be at least 100 pages or more of, of information. Um, I'm surprised to see I'm the only one here. But um, I guess I only have one comment on what I saw, and that would be uh, a concern over the bike trails. And um, I saw a lot of, by the way, I saw a lot of very useful information in the report. One thing I didn't see is any kind of counts on bicycle usage anywhere. Now, I may have missed it in the 100 plus pages, but uh, since that, and so I'm commenting on section seven as I understand it, um, that would seem to be the, the goal, or one of the goals of that section. 
one would think that there'd be some sort of count on, you know, since I would imagine that's a significant cost in, in extending these trails and so forth. Um, I, I would like to think that we would have counted current bike traffic somehow, some way, even if it was just cameras with a loop of film uh, look, looking at every movement that went by certain locations. Um, I am sort of concerned that if we build it, they will come is maybe a thought process. Um, I'm also concerned on funding it. You know, if, you know, I don't know what uh, percentage of the citizens utilize bikes to a large extent, I mean, other than riding, you know, half a mile or something like that. But I'm just wondering what percentage of the city would use this. And is there any thought towards increasing costs of bicycle licenses uh, or if they even exist? Or how how will the, the bike population, if we're going to allocate any significant amount of funds towards this, how will they let's say, disproportionately support this since it's primarily for them. I've seen, well, I've encountered a lot of inconvenience. Again, part of it is probably just adjusting to what's happened on the roadways. But so oftentimes you're on a, a two lanes each way street, and I realize that's outside of this discussion, but it has a bearing on it. And, and that is... You're on a two-way, two lanes each way. Suddenly, it it cuts down to one lane each way, and there's a lot of chaos at that point on any road that's used, particularly in rush hour and so forth. But anyway, just not to avoid rambling, and I don't don't have a prepared presentation. Those would be my concerns. Um, we advertise the trail that was put in from Lindale Avenue going east as a Bloomington's newest nature trail. And I used to go down there a lot. There were beaver, um, other animal, fox uh, populations. They're all gone. I mean, the, if the construction process didn't destroy it, the usage did. Now, the usage is probably a good thing. Citizens are using that area a lot more. But, you know, I, I would say it's Bloomington's newest freeway, not... Bloomington's newest nature center, walk, trail, whatever, um, just because at least particularly by Lindale Avenue, that area is so narrow that putting a 10-foot wide paved path plus a 15 or 20-foot wide on each side took out most of the area for at least three blocks, which is where I noticed the beaver and the fox populations. But anyway, that would be a concern. Um, I realize this is coming from the Met Council, so, you know, it's not entirely in your hands on changing the funding or anything like that, but I do have concerns that way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, anyone else who would like to testify on this item? Is there anyone online for this item? Chair Roman, uh, we have no one online for this item. Thank you. Given that, I would entertain a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second to close the public hearing. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The public hearing is closed. Um, I would like to take a, a moment to um, offer a little bit of comment based on what we heard. Um, the comprehensive plan is a very large document. Uh, and Commissioner Corman and I worked on it with the, when the plan was uh, developed over about a two to three year period. So you're right, it is long. Um, the plan itself was adopted by the city in 2018. So um, while you, uh, the, the revisions we see today are very focused, um, the plan itself is, is in some ways it's, it's directive, but in many ways also it's, it's visionary. So um, the planning manager can correct me if I'm mistaken, but I don't know that the, it, you know, the, the plan sets out visions for types of streets, types of bike corridors per, potentially, but those are, uh, if they were to be built, where they would be built. I don't think it, it's not prescriptive that those will be built in a certain period of time. Is that accurate? Chair Roman, that is accurate. Okay. 
So um, I think that, that gets to some of those questions about, um, and as far as why there aren't any specific details, um, again, if, if, a, if a certain corridor was to be converted, there would be those details would be studied. It would be brought to the Planning Commission during an annual um, transportation plan or a thing like that where it would be up for conversation. So um, those are the, my observations on some of the general things. I would say, personally for me, I think nothing in here is, is a big deal. Uh, I think I, I appreciate that the council is updating uh, these types of information on a regular basis. Uh, I think that I would encourage somehow for the city, and if that's me as a planning commission member or um, some sort of a communication back to the Met Council, I think there's a better way to incorporate this information than using a significant amount of staff time to amend a comprehensive plan notice it, all these things that have to go to these jurisdictions, the other jurisdictions have to weigh in, we have a public hearing. I, there's nothing wrong with the content of what's being updated, but I think the process that's been given to us is wholly overkill for what this is. So in some capacity, I would like us to somehow get, and again, if it's just me, then I, I can write a letter, that's fine. Um, but I just think that there are ways for the city to adopt this information, receive this information, which is good information. But uh, as was pointed out by Planner Ramley Olson accurately, there are things in the comp plan that are have changed, and that's that's the case when you design a plan once every ten years. It it does some of it happens, some of it doesn't. So that's my only observation. It's not about the content. It's not about the good work our staff has done. I just think it. We ask a lot of our staff, and this is probably not the highest and best use of their time. But I support the amendments because we're required to make them. Uh, Commissioner Cookton. Mr. Chair, thanks. And um, if you're going to write a letter, I'm happy to sign it. Uh, it's funny how sometimes you're on the exact same page as somebody else. This just felt like a gross overreaction to we have six people here in the council chambers that are staff members. Mr. Ramler Olson's online. I imagine our attorney is online. We've got eight staff members to draw a couple of shaded lines in our our comp plan. That's not to devalue the content or to devalue the work we're doing or to devalue the what it is. I, we heard good public testimony tonight. We take that seriously. Um, the, the comp plan, as you mentioned, is not an approval of new plans. It's a visionary document. And to change, to change these a few maps and put this much effort into it, you know, I believe that municipal government is here to serve our residents. We're the closest form of government to our people, right? That's that's what municipal government's for is to to serve our residents. And I don't feel like we served our residents on this. And our residents pay taxpayer dollars for us to spend a lot of time doing nothing. And it's it's disappointing. And I support that if there's a way, whether it's our mayor, whether it's our planning department, whether it's you and I, I, I think a message should be sent back to whether it's the Met Council or the state or why ever we had to do this, that this was not a good use of taxpayer dollars or staff time. Commissioner Albrecht. Uh, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I just want to echo what uh, Chair Roman and Commissioner Cookton have said about this. Um, my other concern about this is sort of the public perception between what is in the Met Council system statement and what gets changed in our comprehensive plan and what things uh, are probably obsolete already in the comprehensive plan that we don't necessarily touch when we do text amendments like this. Um, so it's confusing is what my response <laughs> is, um, particularly to folks who are not uh, planners by day or even planners um, by trade. So uh, that is just, I, I agree with both the commissioners on this and um, I'm also willing to sign some sort of letter if that goes out. And again, I want to, I think I said this at the beginning, I want to be clear, the work that the Met Council has done to update this information is very valuable and it's very useful. It's the question of how do we receive and, and incorporate that is the, that, that phase of the process is the part where I had an observation. So I want to be make sure I'm clear that it's great that the Met Council does this periodically and I think it's useful for us. If anyone has any other discussion or would like to entertain a motion, um, Planner Ramo also you may want to flip one slide back or forward, whichever one has the language for us. Commissioner Cookton. 
Mr. Chair, in case PL2023-34, I move to recommend approval of the Comprehensive Plan Amendment revising Sections 4 and 7 in accordance with the 2022 System Statement issued by the Metropolitan Council in September 2022. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second to recommend approval of the Comp Plan Amendment. Any amendments? Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? This item will move to the May 22nd City Council meeting as a public hearing. Thank you. The next item is a study item on the city's neighborhood trans traffic management plan. And we have our esteemed city engineer, Julie Long, here with Ray Hayhurst from Kimley Horn. And I will turn it over to you. All right. Thank you. I, uh, Chair Roman, I think you did most of the thing because all I was going to do was introduce introduce Ray from Kimley Horn, who's our consultant who's been working on our neighborhood traffic management plan, and it includes speed limits, looking at traffic calming and other things to help improve the livability of our community. Yeah. Thank you for uh, having me uh, here tonight, and um, yeah, as, as Julie mentioned, we've been uh, working on uh, the neighborhood traffic management program since January, and we'd like to provide uh, this commission uh, an update on the work that we've done and the work ahead of us. So our agenda for uh, tonight's presentation, we want to provide uh, an overview of the project, its purpose, its goals, and the schedule. Uh, we'll present the proposed uh, speed limits on local streets, as well as the proposed uh, traffic calming request program. Uh, we'll provide a summary of the feedback that we've heard from the public thus far, as well as how we will incorporate uh, their feedback into future recommendations. So for some background, uh, the Neighborhood Traffic Management Program is focused on local streets in the city. Uh, it does not include county roadways, arterials, and collectors. And so the purpose of this program is to identify not only the safety and traffic challenges on local streets, but also to identify the opportunities to create strategies that improve saferhood, safe neighborhood mobility. So we want to build on uh, the city's existing neighborhood traffic programs as well as add new programs uh, that reflect the city's commitment to safety and livability of its neighborhoods. And I wanna emphasize that this program is only one part of the city's broader transportation strategy. We, we realize that while local streets account for the overwhelming majority of roadway mileage, you know, they, they the local streets are not necessarily the busiest or the most well-traveled streets, nor are they where nor or nor are they where uh, the greatest safety challenges exist. So we just want to acknowledge that uh, up front. So again, uh, really, the the purpose of the program is to strengthen and integrate the city's existing programs. Tonight, uh, we'll. Uh, present on the speed limits on local streets as well as the traffic calming request program. Um, again, we're creating a comprehensive approach to manage traffic speeds and improve safety as well as increasing access for people uh, not traveling by automobile. So that's people walking, biking, and taking transit and really um, advancing the goals that the city has already set through its active trans transportation plan and other uh, initiatives. So we've identified six overall uh, program goals. Uh, these goals are consistent with the city's comprehensive plans and uh, existing initiatives. Those goals include safety, mobility, accessibility, equity, efficacy and uh, fiscal sustainability, as well as being clear and easy to understand. I wanna emphasize that last one. Um, 
our goal is to develop a program processes that are easy to navigate and in a program that more community members are aware of and can take advantage of uh, and know uh, their benefits. As I'll touch on later in this presentation, based on our review of the existing traffic calming re request program, that hasn't, necessarily, hasn't been the case uh, thus far. So this slide shows a uh, timeline of, of the project. Uh, we're at the end of the first phase. Uh, we have uh, reviewed existing programs, collected data, uh, talked to the community, and presented our initial uh, proposals uh, that we'll present here tonight. Based on the feedback that we received from the commission, as well as the city council, uh, we will develop recommendations uh, that incorporate uh, your feedback as well as the feedback that we've heard from the community. Um, we will present those draft recommendations to the community for uh, another round of public engagement uh, before we come back to uh, the commission and the city council uh, this summer for uh, with the final report. So the first element of, of the program uh, that I'll touch on are proposed speed limits on local streets. So currently the existing uh, speed limits on local streets uh, is 30 miles per hour uh, today. There are no exceptions for school zones or areas with higher pedestrian activity. And this, the 30 mile per hour speed limit is, I guess, a legacy of the state's uh, state statute, which only recently changed in 2019, that allows municipalities in Minnesota uh, to consider changing speed limits on local streets. So you might have heard that uh, city of Minneapolis, St. Paul, St. Louis Park, Adina, and others have lowered speed limits on their local streets. And so when we considered um, change, proposed changes to speed limits on the local streets, we identified three specific goals. The first goal is promote safer speeds. We know based on research that higher speeds lead not only to more crashes, but they also lead to greater crash severity, especially for vulnerable road users, uh, such as pedestrians, elderly, and young children. So with that in mind, we wanna set speed limits that promote safer speeds but we recognize that just changing the speed limit alone won't automatically you know, change driver behavior. Really, that change in the speed limit needs to be accompanied by traffic homing, education, and targeted enforcement strategies. The second goal is to maintain consistency. As I mentioned before, other communities uh, adjacent to Bloomington have lowered their speed limits on local streets. And so when we consider changes here in the city to local, uh, local street speed limits, we wanna maintain some level of consistency because we know from many drivers cross through multiple communities in a given day, on a given trip, and so having a consistent speed limit kind of leads to greater voluntary compliance. And third, we wanna set reasonable expectations. Uh, based on the data that uh, the city has collected, most, but not certainly not all, dr drivers on local streets are traveling 
below 30 miles per hour on local streets. So we know other communities in the metro area have lowered speed limits on local streets to 20 miles per hour. That is something that we considered, but ultimately given uh, the conditions on uh, many of Bloomington's local streets where there's perhaps less on-street parking, wider right-of-way, um, different block lengths, um, 20 miles per hour would have been perhaps a speed limit that would be unreasonable to most drivers and would not lead to voluntary uh, compliance. So we want to find, we want to set speed limits at a level so that most people voluntarily comply with. Um, and then for, you know, and then for the remaining percentage of people who don't, you know, comply with that speed limit, using other strategies such as traffic calming and uh, targeted enforcement to bring more people uh, into compliance. So our proposal uh, is a statutory 25 mile per hour speed limit for all local streets. So that's shown in blue uh, on the map with consideration for a lower speed limit in school zones. That consideration uh, is for a posted 20 mile per hour speed limit on larger streets around both public and private charter schools during arrival and dismissal periods. We would want, we would propose evaluating straight streets on a case by case basis in partnership with schools, uh, including the Bloomington Public Schools, uh, as well as Hennepin County, as we recognize that many larger streets around uh, schools in the city are owned by the county. So France by Jefferson, Old Shakopee and Nicollet by Kennedy as an example. And so we wanna have those conversations with the schools and with the county uh, and not have a blanket one size fits all approach to school zone speed limits. Uh, as, part of the, as part of this proposal, uh, we would consider uh, updating the Safe Routes to School district-wide plan for K-8 public schools, recognizing that any proposed changes to speed limits in school zones should also be accompanied by other strategies, engineering, enforcement, education. The next element of the program uh, that I'll touch on is the traffic calming request program. So the city currently has a existing multi-step uh, resident initiated traffic calming request program. Uh, and this is for, uh, again, local streets in the city. It begins with a petition by residents um, and an application with a petition supporting an application to the city staff. Uh, in summary, city staff reviews and scores the project. Data is collected on where uh, the applic application is for um, based on the data collected. If there's a demonstrated speeding issue, uh, there would be community engagement around a, a potential project. Uh, staff would make a recommendation for a traffic calming device uh, subject to approval by Planning Commission and City Council uh, before final cost es estimates are, are developed and the project is put out to bid for construction. And those existing traffic calming options uh, 
there are many in the city's toolbox. Um, the most, the options that you'll most likely see are speed humps, uh, neighborhood traffic circles, uh, as well as bulb outs. So based on our review of the existing program, uh, as well as a scan of best practices uh, for other municipal traffic calming request programs, we've identified uh, the following go specific goals for any changes to the program. First off, you know, we want to maintain the city's commitment to improving quality of life by addre addressing persistent uh, traffic issues. Uh, we want to simplify the existing multi-step process and make it clear and easy for residents to understand and to participate in. As that, as we had identified, that is has not been the case, as very few traffic calming requests have been, applications have been submitted and very few have been constructed in Ten, 10 years, yeah. Um, additionally, we wanna provide sufficient off-ramps in the process, um, and I'll, I'll touch on that uh, later, uh, elaborate on what I mean by off-ramps. We wanna use screening criteria that reflects uh, the city's priorities uh, as it relates to safety, mobility and access, and equity. We want to streamline the larger set of toolboxes that the city has identified and, and really prioritize options that the city has experience building uh, and that are proven countermeasures uh, to you know, reduce crashes and reduce crash severity uh, by reducing speeds. We want to provide trial options for traffic calming. So being able to test ideas. Uh, this has been done recently as part of the pavement management program, but being able to test certain traffic calming options, get community feedback, uh, and based on that feedback, refine the design and perhaps uh, make the investment in a more permanent uh, fully built out <laughs> traffic calming treatment. Um, and then lastly, you know, we want to continue to use city resources efficiently to manage the program and not create a burden on staff resources and taxpayer, uh, taxpayer funds. And lastly, uh, a goal we identified was looking for a alternative funding source. The current funding source for the traffic calming request program is a special tax assessment. And we've identified that as a potential barrier for some residents to participate in the program. Many other munis, several other municipalities have gone away from special tax assessments for traffic calming treatments and they've they've used more general funds uh, to pay for traffic calming. So what that looks like uh, is a more, hopefully <laughs> as you see it, a more streamlined process uh, that is cyclical in nature. I'll highlight the key, the key difference being the public request and the request screening step in the very beginning. So currently staff receives applications from residents on a one by one basis and kind of has to make a determination and prioritize just based on seeing one application. What we think will work better is having a more of a set rolling period where city staff receives multiple requests, say over several weeks or, or months and they're able to prioritize requests based on established uh, screening criteria. 
the benefit of, of this cycle is to make it more predictable, more transparent, and allow staff to prioritize and perhaps efficiently use uh, resources. The process uh, has several off-ramps, uh, one of which is related to the public request. So if staff receives a request and it's a, deemed an immediate safety issue, that's an off-ramp for you know city staff to consider other interventions, not necessarily traffic calming, to address kind of immediate safety issues. Traffic signals out, pavement condition is, is so bad that <laughs> it's causing safety hazards for all users, uh, stuff like that. Another off-ramp is related to step two. So, you know, based on the screening of applications, if an application is does not score highly based on the set criteria, that request is not advanced forward, but could be considered in future rounds of, of the process. Other off-ramps include, uh, you know, if staff collects uh, speed counts and collects more data and determines that there is no immediate issue, you know, there's no speeding or the issue at hand cannot necessarily be addressed by this program, then that application, that request wouldn't necessarily be advanced forward. Um, and then lastly, um, obviously the approval process, if, if staff brings a project forward to the planning commission and city council and there's perhaps no consensus among, among the community or uh, this body and the city council doesn't feel like it's, it's a good project, that's also an off-ramp uh, uh, in the process. Um, another benefit of the proposed traffic calming request program is it's the ability to kind of inform and feed into the city's existing pavement management program process. So what that looks like um, in practice, uh, informing the city's existing uh, PMP look ahead neighborhood meeting uh, where city staff discusses traffic issues, kind of the spring in the year before implementation. Um, it also allows an opportunity to do more, to test with traffic coming trial projects, um, test you know certain traffic coming treatments the year before uh, construction. So an opportunity to get feedback from the community um, on what a certain treatment might look like, and also you know based on that feedback, adapt and refine or perhaps not even advance a project. And again, uh, the proposed traffic coming request program would be for local streets only, and that would include streets with planned construction, so either on the capital in, uh, improvement program or the PMP. Uh, streets that would not be eligible would be non-local streets, streets with active construction, or cul-de-sacs or short uh, street segments. This slide uh, shows the screening criteria that I mentioned. I won't go into too much detail, but um, it it allows city staff to prioritize requests where community and transportation needs are greatest. And it's a, an opportunity for the city to be very transparent about the criteria that they're using in, in the process. So that the proposed criteria uh, would, you know, include, would be related to equity, uh, com community destinations, uh, people, so kind of 
prioritizing requests that perhaps have the greatest benefit for the most amount of people. So kind of looking at residential land uses and residential density as a, as a proxy. I also want to look at safety and experience as well as uh, existing traffic volumes. I'll note that additional data such as speed counts and turning movements uh, would be collected uh, later in the process. So we've divided the toolbox of traffic calming options into two tiers. Uh, the first tier uh, would include curb extensions, neighborhood traffic circles, and then vertical devices. So that's speed tables, speed cushions, and speed humps. And for all of those options, uh, that would include both trial and permanent treatments. The second tier of options would be for uh, requests kind of routed through the payment management program. And that would include chicanes, partial closures, diverters, and chokers. All these options are kind of a, a step above in terms of engineering complexity and constructability. And each of these options kind of or especially partial closures and diverters re really requires a broader study of the adjacent transportation uh, network uh, as it greatly would impact, uh, not greatly, but it would impact uh, tr traffic movements within a given neighborhood. So some considerations for these traffic calming options that we're looking at um, can really be classified into three buckets. So kind of effectiveness, how, how effective is the traffic calming device at reducing speeds, reducing the number of crashes, and reducing crash severity. The second bucket is related to costs. So not only capital construction costs, but also the full life cycle costs, so operations, and maintenance, uh, which leads to the third, third bucket of you know, considering the ease of use and other impacts of a Giffen traffic calming option. So that's related to maintenance, ADA accessibility, any potential impacts on bicyclists and pedestrians, as well as environmental impacts. I think it's important to note with each of these traffic calming op options uh, it really matters on context and, you know, each of them in themselves are good tools for very specific uh, problems. So as we advance in this, uh, with this program, we want, we'll provide greater details for each of the options so that it's not only crystal clear for, for staff and uh, city leadership, but also for the public to understand uh, some of the, the benefits and considerations and when certain tools are appropriate for certain uh, situations. So again, making it clear and easy, uh, easier for, for people to understand uh, what the city is doing and, and what options are available. All right, and then I want to wrap it up with uh, a summary of what we've heard uh, thus far uh, from, from the public and stakeholders. So we've held, uh, a, we held a virtual open house uh, last month uh, on March 29th, and we have held uh, three separate pop-up events, one at the Winter Farmer's Market, another at Kennedy High School, and one last week at Southgate apartments. Uh, in addition, we've had a interactive map and online survey uh, posted to the project website on the Let's Talk Bloomington platform. And so what we've heard so far are 
kind of three common themes. Uh, the first being of limited awareness of the existing traffic calming program. Many people have no idea that such a program exists. The second thing that we heard, um, and this is perhaps not surprising to you all, is the importance of safety near schools and the safety of our most vulnerable road users, the really the most vulnerable people in the community, our kids. And lastly, uh, we heard specific safety concerns in the neighborhoods, uh, but also non-local streets. So outside the, the purview of, of this program, but I think it's important to note that a lot of people's safety concerns are on busier non-local streets. So we wanna acknowledge you know, what we've heard and, uh, from the community. So again, uh, we'll incorporate key themes and specific feedback into our recommendations. And we'll discuss these recommendations uh, with the public and stakeholders uh, based on kind of who we, we heard from thus far and who we want and who we haven't heard from. Uh, we want to uh, refine our public engagement approach and, and reach a greater uh, cross segment of, of the community. So again, we'll have update project website, uh, updated survey and interactive map uh, with open houses and uh, pop-up events. And yeah, and just to recap, uh, after we have heard from the community, we will refine our draft recommendations and present them to the Planning Commission uh, later this summer. And with that, uh, I'll take questions. Okay. So this is a study item. So staff and the consultant are looking for thoughts and feedback on some of the concepts that are in place. Um, I, I will say, I don't know about others, I did participate in the virtual open house. It was, you know, I think it was well received. It, and uh, you know, Kirk Roberts is not here, but he was part of that and did a, staff did a really, and the consultant did a really nice job with that. Um, so any observations or discussion? Commissioner Albrecht. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just have a question. <clears throat> Based on the experience of Minneapolis and St. Paul and some of the other cities that you listed on reducing the or having a uh, citywide speed limit, what has been the successes and challenges with that in those cities? And are we are those being incorporated into what we're considering? Yes. Um, I, I should mention that um, my firm, Kimberly Horn, we help the city of Minneapolis with their reduction of speed limits on local streets. So we're very familiar with some of the challenges uh, and some of the successes that they've had. Um, one of the challenges that they've had on reducing speed limits on kind of larger streets was the need to retime traffic signals that kind of match up with the newer, lower sp speed limit. Um, another challenge that they've had w is compliance. While their streets are generally narrower and there's more parked cars, they, the 20 mile per hour speed limit is perhaps set too low for, for what is realistically what most drivers would find acceptable. And so that the issue of voluntary compliance, uh, sorry, it is, an, it is an issue. And so I think just caution that it, 20 miles per hour would probably set unreasonable expectations, especially in Bloomington where, you know, a lot of the streets were built later, typically wider and many residential neighborhoods have uh, and properties have driveways, so less on street parking. So the streets themselves feel wider and more drivers have different expectations of what is a acceptable speed. 
so my initial yep. feedback and response to the difference between Minneapolis, St. Paul, St. Louis Park, and Bloomington yep. um, is as an avid walker of my neighborhood mm-hmm. that does not have sidewalks, which we have talked about um, multiple times. Um, the increased speed of vehicles, which I understand because when I'm driving, I'm yep. also driving those, <laughs> those yep. speed limits, um, makes it less comfortable to walk. Mm-hmm. And the only place to walk is in the street. So I don't really know. That was just my initial thought was I understand that the compliance is a, is a big issue, but I do think that there are, we do have some issues on where our community folks can walk in terms of neighborhoods in our city. Commissioner Cookton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Hayhurst, um, do you have, or does Kinley Horn, very large company, do you have experience with a reduction in speed limit of communities that look more like Bloomington, suburban, larger streets? Uh, not citywide, but we have done lowered speed limits in in other municipalities uh, around the country. So anecdotally, um, with our wider streets, uh, the chance of success at 25 miles per hour do you find that to be a, a reasonable limit that's, that could be followed? Or are our streets so wide that even 25 is going to be too low and people are just are not going to follow that? Do you have any anecdotal data yeah, to support Based that? on the, the data that city staff has collected, uh, specifically Kirk Roberts, um, we think 25 miles per hour is reasonable based on the speeds that we're seeing today for the majority of drivers. We think 25 miles per hour will lead to a you know, voluntary compliance at a acceptable level. Thank you, if, I'm, if I may again. Um, I'm an analytical yep. um, engineer myself, and yep. I'm curious, do you have any analytics on crash data, pedestrian safety, et cetera? Is there any analytics to maybe there just hasn't been enough time, but Minneapolis or St. Paul or whatever that has enacted one of these changes, is there any analytics I can say whether it's working or it hasn't had that big of an impact, or do we have any data on that? Yes, there there is research that Julie and I can certainly provide. Of um, It's been primarily larger communities that have lowered their speed limits. So, for example, City of Boston, which is definitely not a pure community of Bloomington. There's been uh, recent uh, research. Um, uh, I believe the Minnesota local. Yeah, uh, Commissioner Crichton, the Local Road Research yep. Board, which is funded from part of the Minnesota gas tax, is recently comp- is in the process of completing a study of the lowered speed limits in Minneapolis and St. Paul and it is showing that they're not meeting the effective goals that they were trying to, but we can provide you a copy of that report once it's released. I don't believe it's technically been released yet, but we also have a report from the LRRB, that's our favorite acronym for Local Road Research Board, um, about speed limits in school zones. So they're they're doing a lot of the same research because a lot of the communities in our area are having the same questions. So we can get you copies of both of those. The the school district one is out, the school zone. I think that data is really important. Um, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm. I don't know if there's going to be a whole lot of argument on reducing the speeds in school zones. That's a very practical thing to provide protection there. But as far as the citywide thing goes, I, I don't know. Um, and so, uh, for me, making this uh, recommendation to council, data will be very important. And I'm hoping that we don't take action on this as a city until that report is finalized. And I mean, if if the data is showing there's there's no difference, and we're going to spend millions of dollars retiming our streetlights. I don't think we're doing our residents a service in that case. But if there is a reduction in, in um, uh, crash injuries, et cetera, um, that's important for us to know, too. I see a, a graph has appeared here. Yep. Uh, this was a graph prepared by, by Kirk Roberts, I yep. guess. Um, yep. 
like you, Commissioner Crichton, we're geeks and we like data. So we actually <laughs> did do some speed analysis of our Bloomington roads, and you can see the scatter plots of what speed limit compliance we're seeing. So 30 miles an hour is where the line is drawn mm. across. Um, you can't probably see the next two tick marks, but the middle one is 25 miles an hour, and the bottom one is 20. And so you can see that we have a lot of people that are already doing that 25 in our neighborhoods. So we think with some education, some limited enforcement, we'll be able to get those people to drop into compliance. That's a better graph, thank yep. you. Um, so we think that's achievable. So um, we think we're gonna be able to get that voluntary compliance on our streets and with some education and outreach, we'll be able to move people in the needle. If we put it down to 20, we're gonna have a lot of people who are no longer in voluntary compliance, and we think that's gonna be a hard bar to achieve. So we're trying to balance the safety of pedestrians walking on the streets versus compliance and making it work for all. So we thought 25 miles an hour was a great first step. So maybe we implement it at 25 citywide, and in 10 years we revisit it and think, oh, it can go down to 20 now because people are slowing down even further. We don't know, but we want to continue to monitor and take the data. Yeah, I would, I, again, <laughs> ask the question I was thinking is, is our, what, what data have we seen in the places that have done it? I think what will be... Uh, interesting and uh, maybe not as satisfying for us is if that study is largely focused on experiences in Minneapolis and St. Paul, which have done this for longer, um, echoing on what Commissioner Albrecht has said, you know, uh, the conflict points in those cities is likely at intersections uh, for pedestrians and mm -hmm. vehicles, whereas in Bloomington, those conflict points are, in most areas, the, in, the entire roadway because of the lack of sidewalks. So I think not to dismiss the data that may be in there, but I think it may not be as helpful to us in, in all areas as it might be in other areas. So, But I think it's good to know, and um, I think that you're right, it, having data before we go on our gut is, is helpful, it's more defensible, it's easier to explain. Commissioner Albrecht? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, another question is, how much does it cost to go down five miles an hour for our city? Um, it would be posting the signs as you come into the community, and then Kirk and I have been discussing all of those signs create uh, confusion because they're most often posted on collectors and arterials, and so there's a sign right behind it with a different message. Um, we haven't quite figured out what to do differently with that. Um, so probably about $75,000 for new signs, because we have a lot of different roads as you enter into the community. Um, but we would not have to post every street sure. by just doing it at the entry points, and that's allowed by state statute. Sure. Um, I guess my thought is, and I know that I kind of contradicting what I said earlier, which is that, but based on this graph alone, I'm not sure, I mean, I'm not sure if, if the goal is to get to 20, then yes, I think going down incrementally makes a lot of sense. But if we have sort of voluntary compliance and that 25 already, and most people are going either 25 or less, then I don't know if we necessarily need to spend $75,000 to to do it. Um, I guess that would be my feedback on it. Commissioner Corman. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious with the slide where you had for uh, speed limits in school zones, um, you have the flashing light, the 20 speed limit flash when flat they want to add that one yep. it says you know speed limit 20 when flashing <coughs> so is that how it's going to look like <laughs> it may not look exactly like that but um ray will indicate um he has a study that says they are most effective when they are done by flashing and not by times i don't have kids mm -hmm. i don't know what time school starts elementary versus middle school i don't know so as a driver, you need to tell me something. I 
happy to slow down, but I don't know what to when to slow down. So when it's flashing, that's clear. Because I think it's, it would be really, really important to make that message really clear to the residents, like you have expressed in your presentation, you know, the most vulnerable people that we have in our community who are also very valuable, it's our kids. And so uh, it is very important that we make sure, you know, regardless of where we end up going with the speed limit in, in streets, uh, that in those streets where the, the schools are, that it definitely should go down. Um, and, that's, and that is very clear for people that that light's there, there's gonna be kids. So I don't know if that would be possible because when I saw this, I was like, oh, this is great. You know, we should be having more lights all around the city with this when we have kids moving so much. And not only the schools, but like the stadium, you know, that area, that's a pretty busy area too. And so I, um, I wanna say thank you for, for, for this work. I think it's, it's very important. It's been expressed by uh, several members in the community throughout the years. Uh, many times, you know, there's there's been requests to to the city for specific areas and schools, and I know that one of those um, speed limit, um, I don't know how you call them, those temporary ones. Um, what are they called? Um, well, you know, when when you try to do the study, that you put this one thing with the number as you're driving, and it shows you what your speed is. A speed trailer. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Okay, so sometimes the city will put those in there to kind of see and study and, and really determine if it's true that people are going fast. But obviously when those are put in there, people slow down. Uh, but then when once that is removed, they go back the same. Correct. Now the other issue is in um, schools like, for example, Hillcrest Community School, where there are um, cars coming from like, a street like, for example, uh, Vincent, where there's a quick left turn and there's no like um, speed pump in there, they go really fast into that. And it's really hard, I think, for some people to really see that, in fact, there is a school there, that there's gonna be a lot of kids and there's no sidewalks in that area. So that's a super dangerous thing. So uh, my feedback is that, you know, to really, as you continue to work in that partnership with the school district, to really look into all the different <laughs> things besides the crosswalks, you know, what else can we do to make sure that we are protecting our kids? In um, winter, it's another issue. You know, winter when it gets so slippery, when it gets so icy, and then you're making those turns, and the kids are right there coming out of, 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 a, of a specific corner or, or into the street, and, or they have nowhere to walk because of the amount of snow sometimes. I mean, Bloomington does a wonderful job at keeping the streets clean. I, I, obviously, that's true, but still, you know, it's weather, and so um, I do appreciate what, what you're gonna do here, and I do appreciate the bringing down that process time, you know, in working with the community to avoid some of those long processes then maybe sometimes they don't even get you to do something different for specific streets. Um, so yeah, thank you. Commissioner Cookton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to follow up again on the cost thing, we talked about 75,000 for signs. Whenever we have to redo a traffic signal, it's shockingly expensive for mm -hmm. redoing something that seems like it would be a couple clicks. Uh, how, have you done an analysis of approximately how many signals would have to be redone? Um, at this time, we're only proposing local street speed limit changes. Right. We're not. We're still working on the collector and arterial, and we're getting a lot of comments on those. But we're not ready to present that to the public, and that's a good feedback on how many signals we will need to um, retime. We have um, Bloomington operates 121 signals now. Not all of those are in our jurisdiction, and some of those are up. Um, serving Terminal 2 of the airport, so those would not all need to be retimed, but there would be significant um, um, number that would need to be retimed. The Hennepin County ones wouldn't be need to, but when we come back with the next phase for speed limits on materials and collectors, we can have that information. May I ask why it's so expensive to retime a street signal? Um, the 
retiming of the street signal is not usually that expensive. It's probably five to seven thousand dollars. It's staff time and running all the different trials mm -hmm. and making sure the computer program you don't have a bug in it because you don't want to put a bug out in the street. The issue is often when we're retiming them, we're also upgrading the controller because we haven't upgraded the controller since 1950. Um, and so the new electronics are expensive. And so the that is the physical hardware is probably the more expensive component of it. A lot of our signals don't have the flashing yellow arrow, arrows. They don't have the ability for it to be plugged in, like there's no, nothing left in the cabinet, so it needs a re new cabinet, you need a new controller. It's all of those extra add-ons that are uh, probably the cost that you're seeing. Thank you. Commissioner Corman? Yeah, just one more thing that I wanted to mention regarding education. You mentioned education, and that's a really good point, you know, educating, once again, the community, reminders of where we need to be, um, especially careful, you know, when we're talking about those school areas. Um, and uh, not only that, but also as you work together with the school district, education for our own kids, right? And education even to our parents who are the ones dropping off kids at a certain time, so there's more traffic and, um, and even staff. So very important, and especially, you know, when those with those, um, with, the, with the stops, with the, with the bus stop and the, and the sign, you know, there's times, many times when people just keep driving. And so education is really important. So thank you for working on this. You know, I think we talk about, you know, the cost of signs and whatnot, but there's a certain percentage of signs that get replaced just because their life cycle has worn out. And sometimes we stretch that a little longer than is optimal because of, of budget or whatever. but. Um, you know, I think it's good to have those data. Um, but I also think that sometimes the right thing is, is the right thing, and we'll see what the numbers tell us. Um, other feedback for staff? Anything else you need from us? Did you get good, good information or at least useful information? I think so. Okay. Thank you. We'll look <laughs> Thank forward you. to seeing what comes next. Thank you. Item three is to consider um, previous meeting synopsis adoption. And the first one, my document up here, is from March 9th. And on March 9th, Commissioners Corman and Albrecht were not here. So um, I would look for a motion on that item. Uh, Mr. Chair, just confirming, um, this seems to come up a lot, but do we have the appropriate number of people to vote on this item? We do. Uh, there were five present, and it would require a vote of three, and that leaves okay. three of us. And I would like to move forward the draft uh, minutes for March 9th, 2023. Second. There's a motion and a second to adopt the Planning Commission synopsis from March 9th. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Abstain. Aye. All right, the motion passes. The next item is the March 23rd meeting synopsis, and Commissioners <laughs> Albrecht and Abdi were not present. I would look for a motion on that one. So moved. Second. second. We have a motion and a second to adopt the March 23rd meeting synopsis. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Abstain. That motion passes. Item number four is the Planning Commission policy and issue update. I'll start with the planning manager. Chair Roman our, and commissioners, our next meeting is in two weeks, May 11th. We have one item on that agenda, and it is a privately initiated city code text amendment to allow K through 12 schools as a conditional use in the I-2 uh, zoning district. And then in four weeks, May 25th, uh, we just have one item on that agenda as well, and that is a city-initiated ordinance uh, granting exceptions to operating hours of mobile food units, also known as food trucks, uh, located within 250 feet of residential zoning districts. That's okay. what we have coming up. All right, and my calendar may, may be wrong, but was there one on May 18th that we've canceled or that was not on on our, my calendar may just be wrong. All right, we'll just go with it. I'm wrong. 
Um, and make the note of that. That's a rare thing, I'll admit. Um, uh, other items, I would personally make a note for anyone who is, um, again, the <laughs> my running joke, the three people who are watching, or if you know people, we do have uh, openings for three seats on the Planning Commission. Applications are being accepted uh, through May 7th, which I believe is a week from Monday. So we've got another 10 days. Um, this is a great opportunity for anyone who's interested in being involved in the community. Um, there are two three-year seats and one two-year vacancy. Uh, and those applications are said due the 7th. I know interviews are coming in, in May, and I believe those um, will terms will begin in July. So um, that's my own personal plug for anyone who's interested or thinks they might be interested. Uh, get in touch with staff. There's information on the website, and I think anyone who's on the commission would be happy to chat with anyone who um, would like to know more. Other items for the uh, go to the order. Seeing none, then we are adjourned until May 11th. <laughs>